This is the ASTDA Distinguished Career Award. And this is presented to someone with a long and extraordinary career in the field of sexually transmitted diseases. I don't think anyone in the room can argue with this year's recipient, and I don't think there's anyone in the room who doesn't like this year's recipient. So I'm going to invite Dr. Tom Quinn to come up and do a brief introduction of Dr. Charlotte Gatos. Congratulations, Charlotte. Uh, it, it really gives me great pleasure and really an honor to be able to introduce you as this year's recipient of the Distinguished Career Award. So well deserving. And I can't think of another individual, just like Bobby said, who's more deserving of this award. And uh, what you have done to advance the entire STD field of diagnostics is phenomenal. Uh, and uh, you've done it by starting from your roots in microbiology, going to standard testing, moving to molecular tests, moving to the internet, uh, and then taking it all into a wide variety of venues. Uh, whether it's a prison, the military, standard STD clinics, uh, and again, out into the internet. Um, so congratulations for receiving this award. It's been a long time coming from my perspective, uh, but you have served on all these executive boards and everything, so you were always excluded when we nominated you, and so we kept recycling our nomination letter. And I thank my co-conspirators in, in joining me in this. So everyone in this field, everyone in this room knows Charlotte Gato. She really doesn't need an introduction. Um, but I think um, it, it would be interesting to highlight a little bit of her background uh, and how she advanced over 40 to 50 years to uh, this pinnacle of receiving this award. So I've taken the liberty of, of kind of going through your life and uh, I really want uh, to share some of these moments uh, with everyone. I've traveled with Charlotte to many of these uh, meetings, and then she's gone on to many more. Uh, and uh, what I uh, kind of learned in preparing for this talk is, is her varied um, career and where she started. That's really her in that top photo. I, I had to ask Joel, is that really her? <laughs> So she got her bachelor's degree in medical technology from the West Virginia University in 64. In 66, she moved on to getting her master's degree uh, from the same university in microbiology. Uh, she met Joel, her life partner, uh, during those years. Uh, and they moved uh, eventually over to Walter Reed, where she uh, was a medical technologist supervisor. Then she saw the light and came to Johns Hopkins uh, in 1987 and joined my laboratory. Uh, but that was very short, uh, brief, because she, she, I couldn't hold her back. She kept moving forward. She got her master's in public health uh, at the uh, Hopkins School, public health. Then she got her doctoral degree. Interestingly, the doctoral degree was uh, in thesis was on chlamydia pneumoniae, and really she moved into this molecular diagnostic field. All of this is happening while her, her family is growing and she's going through a number of different adversities, uh, which Charlotte and I well know. Um, but she was promoted to assistant professor in 1995, associate professor in 2001, and was recognized as a international leading expert in the field of sexually transmitted infections and was promoted the professor of medicine, epidemiology, emergency medicine, and the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health. Zentleman wanted me to throw that photo in, by the way. <laughs> He's not here. <laughs> but again, Charlotte just uh, was so enthusiastic and, and so interesting in expanding this whole field of diagnostics. She became the director of the Hopkins International STI Respiratory Disease and Biothreat 
uh, Research Laboratory. She's authored over 500 research articles, 28 book chapters, 700 research abstracts and oral presentations. I don't think there is an STI meeting that Charlotte hasn't attended. <laughs> she really has revolutionized the field as in uh, new diagnostics for chlamydia trichomonas, uh, for Neisseria gonorrhea, trichomonas vaginalis, M. genitalium, and she continues uh, in this work. She started out again with the basic biology, culture, then going to EIA, then PCR, TMA, SDA, any kind of specimen that could be collected, self-collected, uh, any venue that we could collect those swabs from. Uh, and she has been the leader of a NIH uh, program project grant on the development of point of care diagnostics for STI, a very important and successful um, uh, program. She has published extensively as to how to use these STI diagnostics for doing prevalence uh, studies, incident studies, cost-effectiveness studies, uh, and so on. I could uh, continue and continue, but I just wanted to highlight just a few of why she's so deserving of this, of this award. This was one of the landmark studies that was done with uh, screening uh, female military recruits to the Army. Uh, and uh, this is one of the most highly cited papers in the literature on chlamydia. And, and overall, 9% of all military recruits in the United States, women, were positive for this pathogen. Uh, and it was a wake-up call for the military. This was not something they routinely were concerned about nor did they want to hear about it. But it was due to Charlotte uh, and Joel, uh, her, her partner in life, uh, that really changed uh, the way the military approached these reproductive tract infections. There are a number of other ones that, that she has really uh, pioneered, but I think this one uh, deserves a lot of attention. You know, as the internet came about, uh, and uh, we started to learn more about uh, how individuals were using the social media uh, to meet, to have sex, uh, to uh, uh, get into uh, risky situations. Uh, Charlotte recognized this and came up with this, I want the kit, internet-based testing uh, for uh, sexually transmitted diseases. She has now screened over 10,000 uh, women and men uh, with self-collected swabs that she sends out as a kit. They come back, they're uh, logged in, uh, diagnostics are performed, and the individuals can find out within 24 to 48 hours whether they're infected or not and be referred into appropriate care. So Charlotte, it has been an amazing uh, adventure, uh, working with you, being my lab partner. Uh, we've, we have shared 30 years working together, um, and, and I'm the one riding on the tails of, of Charlotte's advances, and it, it's been truly uh, an amazing experience. Our lab has grown and grown. Uh, she's been the leader of, of these uh, individuals. They respect her, they look up to her. She's been a mentor to all of these individuals. Uh, and it's really amazing how she has really uh, risen uh, to being that outstanding mentor that's so deserving of this award. Now, she's done uh, more than just run a laboratory and develop these diagnostics. I don't know where she gets all this energy, uh, but she has it. She uh, joined the executive board of ASTDA from 07 to 2012. She then joined the uh, executive board of ISSTDR from 07 to 2013, then became a director for North America region at IUSD 06 to 2015, and became president-elect of IUSD, then president, uh, and uh, also is the recipient of the ASTDA Achievement Award uh, that you just heard about. So uh, I want to say that she has been a friend and colleague to nearly everyone in this room, uh, if not everyone in the room. 
And uh, it doesn't matter whether we're in Vienna, uh, we're in St. Petersburg, uh, or wherever. There is Charlotte, and she's uh, uh, meeting with people and sharing ideas and collaborations. Truly amazing. Sometimes they happen in heart-shaped tubs. I, I, don't ask me why we're in this heart-shaped tub, but, but we are, and we remember some of the people who I know would share this same kind of recognition for you, Charlotte, Walt Stam, uh, and everyone else that's in that photo. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't also give recognition uh, that behind every successful woman is a very supportive man. Uh, and I think that bears mentioning uh, today. Joel Gatos, uh, they've been married for 54 years. He has been there every step of the way. And uh, Joel, you're just as equally deserving of this award, and I know Charlotte will share it with you. And I know you sometimes go incognito at our events and galas, uh, but we recognize both of you no matter what you wear. So I want to say to Charlotte, congratulations. Keep riding the dolphin, forging ahead into the future, uh, and, and really having uh, the adventure of your life. So could everyone please stand and give recognition to Charlotte Gatos. I'm just going to say on a personal note, I'm really thrilled that I'm the one who happened by chance to be in office. She had been nominated so many times, but she kicked me frequently to make me go back to school. And so a large part of my career, yeah. don't make me cry. <laughs> yeah, for the three of us. Well, Tom, you embarrass me. <laughs> so, thank you to the ASTDA. The title of my talk today is Two Loves. These are my disclosures. Thank you to the ASTDA. I am completely humbled and appreciative of this honor, and especially thank all of you in the ASTDA board who made this possible. A famous person once said, or maybe a wise person, if you find a job that you love, you will never work a day in your life. I found two such jobs, my family and my job at Johns Hopkins. Where I am today is because I have been able to stand on the soldiers, the shoulders of the many giants who preceded me. Joel is the biggest giant. He's loved and supported me for many years. My children are giants. Dr. Steve on the left, Dr. Kathy uh, next to him, uh, Professor Jenny, a college professor, and uh, Dr. Joe Gatiss, uh, a veterinarian that keeps our family into the wild. They were cute little babies and cute little giants, too. Jenny will hate me for this picture. <laughs> but the grandchildren are the fun in giants, 15 of them boys and girls, pretty, pretty nice kids. And here we all are together. TNTC. Those of you who have not worked in a laboratory may not know that this stands for too numerous to count. <laughs> and yes, this spring, we got all of these grandchildren graduated from either high school or college. It was a phenomenal, fun year. So I have lots of other giants to thank on whose shoulders I have stood, 
all of the people that I worked with at Johns Hopkins listed here, and there's many more. I ran out of space. I, I can't name them all. Many people in this room that I have worked with and collaborated with and enjoyed being uh, able to take advantage of having their, their giant mentorship. Uh, and um, many of you who uh, are not listed on this, you're, you're here and you're in my heart. And then uh, internationally, all of the people that I've worked with, uh, with uh, IUSTI and made many friends over the years. And I'd kind of like to dedicate this lecture to the female scientists in the room. Uh, Patty's already mentioned many of them, and uh, I would just like to say that uh, it's been my pleasure to, uh, to work with, uh, with you and to know you uh, and to have benefit, benefit, to be able to, be, to benefit from your guidance. So thanks to the IUST team. You all saw the ASTDA uh, team. And uh, uh, anyway, um, we've had a lot of fun. And thanks to, uh, to all of you all. So in every field of human endeavor, there's a handful of persons that are synonymous with said endeavor. In English, we think of Shakespeare, infectious diseases. We think of the name John Bartlett. And this is completely synonymous with this discipline. He was our first, uh, my first um, uh, mentor uh, when I worked with him uh, on an AIDS grant before I started working uh, with uh, Tom. Uh, and um, so he was our division leader and uh, supported me. However, Tom Quinn, too, in my book's pretty big giant. There he is. I don't know if he's looking uh, happy, surprised, or uh, curious. But anyway, thank you, Tom. And then I have to say many thanks to all the technicians, students, coordinators, postdocs, administrators who have been the giants who actually supported me, um, as well as to God for my many gifts and my good health. And some of the uh, technicians are uh, sitting here at the uh, table, uh, Khalil and Jack uh, and, uh, and the faculty and Johan and uh, Justin uh, and Anne Rompalo, of course, and Dr. Wang and uh, uh, Yo Shang. And um, so it's been, it's been wonderful. Thank you. So my second love was microbiology and infectious diseases. When I began at Walter Reed many years ago, there was no AIDS, and there was not much interest in STIs. We didn't even know what chlamydia was. We called it bedsonia. We thought it was a virus. Um, there's a little interest in syphilis and gonorrhea. Uh, was there even birth control then? Uh, maybe not. You can see what happens. <laughs> When I began at jo uh, Johns Hopkins with Bartlett, we did not know what caused AIDS. They only knew that men had diarrhea, and that's what we studied. When I began with Tom, as he mentioned, we had a culture committee on tissue culture. So I had a lot of fun, and I loved uh, participating in the changes and standing with these giants. So this is an overview of what I want to try to cover today. Some successes and some failures, and I'll tell you about those. I'm going to talk a little bit about chlamydia, our army testing of recruits, uh, PCRs and NATs, some epi, and I want the kit, and uh, finally, uh, my latest love point of care test. So we've had a lot of changes over my lifetime. <laughs> I remember that dial phone. Uh, so there have been a lot of changes in communication and social media. So an early love was chlamydia pneumoniae. With Tom Quinn and, and um, uh, Steve Holland, we published uh, the first PCR for chlamydia that differentiated it from chlamydia cytosy and chlamydia pneumoniae by DNA. Um, we also were able to uh, sequence, sequence the 16S gene and compare the phylogenetic relationship of it, C. pneumoniae to the other chlamydia. So we looked at a lot of studies on chlamydia pneumoniae, looking in immunocompromised populations, symptomatic and asymptomatic people, um, and uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we even uh, worked with Max Chernisky to try to see if we could have a commercial assay uh, for chlamydia pneumoniae. And sadly, uh, this, I guess, would say one of our big failures is today there still is no commercial test for chlamydia pneumoniae. Um, so 
Uh, Tom mentioned uh, some of the screening with the military recruits. We did show the Army that 10% that of their recruits coming in, and this is sort of a failure too, uh, even though we showed them that it would be cost effective if they could just screen their recruits, they wouldn't have to treat them uh, in a few years for, uh, for PID with a couple of cost effectiveness studies. We did uh, publish that New England Journal article showing 13,000 women uh, that were screened, and then uh, we screened some men along the way, and um, then later on we screened a total of 23,000 and showed that every year of the four years of the study, the prevalence increased, irrespective of where they came from or other uh, things that would influence it. And then I guess this was sort of a failure too, uh, but this was a study with Catherine Clark, who's my daughter, uh, and Joel and me. Uh, and we looked uh, at hospitalization rates uh, in female uh, Army recruits and uh, showed them that uh, many of them developed PID. Uh, but sadly, uh, and this was a failure, uh, the Army still doesn't screen women who come into the Army for chlamydia even though the other services like the Air Force, the Navy, the Coast Guard, they all do. So then we came into the um, era of NAT testing. Um, and I had a lot of fun here working with many scientists in the commercial fields. We also showed that DNA could persist in urine. We uh, demonstrated that you could pull samples, that the power of the amplification test was so powerful you could screen samples and screen more than once um, at the same time. So uh, over the years, uh, as Tom mentioned, I work with many commercial companies, uh, and um, right before that, uh, started having commercialization. And you might not know this, but chlamydia was the first ever infectious agent that received a commercial claim uh, for PCR. But anyway, um, we, we worked with um, uh, ProbeTech, uh, we worked with Aptima, we worked with TMA, and we worked with expert uh, uh, PCR for chlamydia gonorrhea and trichomonas. And thankfully today now we have lots of uh, tools in our toolbox to be able to test uh, for STDs. And now a couple of other failures. Uh, with uh, my friend Maggie Ma Hammerschlag and uh, Tom, uh, we, uh, there was a great interest at one point of whether or not chlamydia and pneumonia was associated with heart disease. Well, uh, some people said yes, some people said no. We didn't find it, even though it's been grown. Uh, Ramirez's paper, uh, where we all collaborated together in a big study uh, with uh, many uh, other people at the University of Washington, showed that you could. There have been some isolates that have been actually grown, but the clinical trials showed that you couldn't keep people from having a heart attack by treating them for chlamydia pneumoniae. So a little bit of a disappointment. Um, this is another failure, but this is a happy failure. I think Maggie would agree that um, there was a group that tried to associate chlamydia pneumonia with multiple sclerosis. Well, there is no association, so this is a happy failure. Then we began to move into the era as we had more clinical uh, commercial assays uh, to show that women could and preferred to collect their own uh, swabs uh, from the vaginal area, and in fact, sometimes they did a better job than the clinicians, and they certainly uh, appreciated being able to collect their own swab. So, what could we do? We have all these new commercial tests now, uh, but the rates kept climbing. Every year we have seen an increase, as you all know, of uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea and trichomonas and herpes and everything. So, um, and the, this, these diseases are especially prevalent in adolescents and young adults. And so despite of the availability of self-collection in a clinic, we didn't really ever make any difference in these young people. So we were thinking, what can we do about this? And it was about the time that I think I learned how to use the internet. And uh, having a bunch of teenagers at the same time, I thought, there are probably a lot of teenagers out there that don't want their parents to know they're sexually active, but they're not going to say, hey, mom, I'm having a discharge. Take me to the clinic. So we thought, ah, could we do something to let them to collect their samples at home? So as Tom mentioned, we came up with I Want the Kit. We uh, underwent a revision in 2013 so that we could make it more HIPAA compliant. 
and have the uh, uh, user select a clinic before they ordered so they would know where they were going to go to get treated. And we also had them obtain their own results and then go for treatment. So we demonstrated in a, in a paper by Cooter uh, that there was no difference. If we called every single positive person or if we said, get your own results, you're, you're, uh, you are empowered to do this study yourself. You did it, get yourself, uh, take yourself to get your results and get treated. So our newly formatted website looks like this. You can get your STI kit and there in the middle you can see you could get an HIV kit under a research study. But the persons could order a vaginal, a penile, or a rectal kit. And now we have just added throats so that people can collect their own throat samples and send them in. So we started out doing focus groups to, to um, see what people wanted, uh, women, because it was only for women when we started. We added men. And uh, so we published a couple of articles and lots of other articles, including uh, the use of a simple risk quiz, six simple questions to determine the risk. So we were hoping that if someone took this quiz, that they would say, oh, I have a high number, I'm probably at risk, and they would be um, encouraged to order a, a kit. So those of you who want to see a little bit of data today, this is a recent analysis. It's actually presented last year at the CDC meeting in DC. But we showed that uh, in about 3,000 people, uh, the risk uh, or the prevalence of having any of the three STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or trichomonas, with a prevalence of about 9.5 for rectal samples and a prevalence of 8.7 for urogenitals combined males and females. So we recently just finished a survey online, uh, which was voluntary, of people who um, uh, we wanted to see, we knew it was acceptable when we started 10 years ago, so we thought we really need to see now what people think. And so um, we, uh, we asked them uh, on a survey, how did you learn about the kit? And we were encouraged to learn that there were lots of uh, different ways that they uh, heard about uh, going online. Uh, this is not a national uh, project. It's only active in the state of Maryland and Washington, D.C., uh, and then we have a, a small pilot uh, contract with Alaska uh, and the Native uh, American people there. They have lots of computers, but they don't have a lot of clinics, and this has worked well. But we also ask on this survey, would you be willing to collect a dried blood spot if you could be screened for syphilis or HIV and mail it in? And I was very surprised that a good proportion of them said yes. So this is something we're thinking about for the future. I mentioned that little uh, dot in the middle on the website that you could order a home HIV test. Uh, so if you want to order an OraQuick test, we would send it to you. And we haven't had any positives because at least that we know of, because the person into the research study is supposed to go back on the uh, kit and say whether or not what their answer was. But mainly it was an acceptability study to see if people would do it. And um, much to our uh, surprise, uh, that many of them said it was easy to collect, follow the instructions to interpret the results and perform it. And they believed their results um, either very much or uh, and they, they would recommend it to a friend and they would test themselves again at home. So this is one small way that we can get people to know their status. However, it was quite funny that they don't want to pay more than 10 or $20. And we've done these surveys with people with point of care tests for STIs and that's all they want to pay is 10 or $20. And they only want to wait 10 or 20 minutes. Um, when uh, the CDC guidelines came out in 2014 recommending NATS and um, vaginal swabs for women, uh, self-collection was uh, approved. They um, also recommended that people be screened for rectal oral pharyngeal uh, samples, but we didn't have any approved tests by then. Uh, we do now. But they did not recommend point-of-care tests. So we were very fortunate to see that the NIH uh, had an RFA for developing a point of care test for STIs. So we applied and we've been very fortunate in 2007 and 12 and, and 18 uh, to be awarded five year grants uh, from the NIH to develop a center of excellence for point of care tests. 
under which we were supposed to test clinical testing of prototype uh, PCR uh, uh, POC devices and collaborate with uh, physical uh, and biochemical scientists and engineers, which we have done. And uh, I think uh, that we're, we'll, we'll start to see some of these good results soon. We were to do needs assessments to ask clinicians and patients what they wanted in a point of care and then to provide training to technology developers. And so we had sort of a pipeline. I don't know if this uh, pointer does. Yeah, it does. That to start out with new technology and then kind of come through a pipeline and come down to someday where we can have an over-the-counter test to, to be available. So the point of care tests are coming along. Um, some are uh, good, some are better than others, and some are not quite point of care yet, but they're near patient. Um, I just want to mention, uh, in our point of care grant, we've had the ability to fund uh, small grants to other uh, small developing uh, companies who want to try to develop a point of care test. Uh, small companies who needed some critical uh, funding to, to get over the hump to get uh, more NIH and uh, national uh, and international funding. So we did funding, uh, we did fund Atlas Genetics, uh, which is now known as Binks. Um, uh, this um, has uh, been published by Wittes, uh, at pr early performance of the kit. Uh, uh, and the test and has been uh, very highly accepted by the women who were in this study. But basically, it's a 30-minute output. Um, and we've also funded a very tiny company which was started by three people, a brother and a sister and another engineer. And now they have been successful in getting some SBIR funding. Uh, their test takes uh, 20 minutes, so stay tuned. We're, we're, we're going along the pathway. And I'd like to especially uh, call out um, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Wong's uh, work with uh, uh, starting about five years ago, I think now, with the MobiNAT. Uh, and this was uh, performed for uh, chlamydia. It was a lamp. We tested it in the emergency department, and it worked uh, pretty well. And this has been published. But um, the latest MobiNAT uh, is for gonorrhea. And uh, you can see it's a very small, I think it's about the size of a can of soup. Uh, it has a wireless uh, connection with a smartphone app, and you get the answer in 15 minutes. So uh, there was a very nice uh, presentation yesterday by uh, uh, Alex uh, Trick, uh, who had a, a very famous video, which I'm sure will be on YouTube very soon. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Um, and then uh, Dr. Melendez uh, is going to tell you uh, more about this assay, but uh, discuss uh, uh, AMR and uh, point of care uh, assays uh, for uh, assay for uh, STIs uh, tomorrow at plenary uh, number 12, early in the morning. So I want to just end with this was a, a little bit of a proof to me, which I thought was a pretty successful outcome that we wanted to see if in our emergency room the use of a near patient test could uh, help clinical management of chlamydia and gonorrhea. So we worked with our partners in the emergency department where, as you all probably know, we still do syndromic screening or the syndromic treatment uh, for uh, STIs in emergency departments. Uh, patients come in and come out and you don't know if you're ever going to see them again. So if the doctor thinks they at least uh, have a chance of being infected, they treat them. So we randomized people who were coming, women who were coming in for a pelvic exam because that's what they do in our ED. Uh, there were 254 of them, and they could be randomized to either get the routine NAT test, which came back in two to three days, versus a more rapid test, which could be returned to the doctor in 100 minutes. In the rapid testing group, I'm happy to report that 100% of the patients with positive results for either chlamydia or gonorrhea were treated. Everyone got treated. Versus the routine testing group, only 56% of the women who were infected got treated. And this was despite a two-week follow-up call to see if they were called and they got their result and they went in and they got treated. They didn't. But sadly for AMR and for antibiotic stewardship, in the uninfected group, these were women who maybe had a UTI, 25% were unnecessarily treated, even in the rapid testing group, because probably they didn't stay more than 100 minutes and probably were let go before the doctor had the uh, point of care results. But the doc it was up to the clinical judgment of the doctor uh, whether to uh, treat them on the basis of these results. However, in the negative group, people not infected, 
47% were overtreated who had no infection. They had no infection, but the doctor treated them anyway for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So to end and let you all get back to the conference, uh, I've learned a few lessons over many years. It's never become complacent about what you're doing, but have fun. I always look for new ways to identify patients and treat them appropriately. That's how we're gonna end this epidemic. Stay aware of new diagnostic technologies because we have to give these tools to the clinicians to be able to treat these patients. And then we have to look for ways to use them in the lab and out of the lab and in susceptible populations the world around. Develop and, and maintain contacts with industry and the FDA. That's how we get these tests into the hands of the clinicians. Uh, we can have the best tests in the world and it may or may not work, but we won't really have confidence that, we're, that it works until we get the FDA to tell us that. So I feel that academic industry and FDA partnerships are critical to the success of uh, giving us the tools we need. And finally, learn to love and enjoy working with your giants and on whose soldier, shoulders, shoulders that you uh, stand. So you want collaborations to be fun, and then you can have the job that you love and you won't work a day in your life. So we can, together with our collaborators, uh, deal with our failures and celebrate our successes. So I'd like to thank all the people in our lab that uh, I've worked with over the years. Thank you.